Hello, this is Gina again with our last lecture for the skeletal system, lecture six. And in this lecture, we'll talk about disorders of the skeletal system, different structures in it, including osteoporosis, arthritis, bursitis, and tendonitis. So I'm sure you've heard of osteoporosis before. It's characterized by a severe loss in bone density. Usually spongy bone is affected first. And you can see the picture on the lower right um, of two thoracic vertebrae bodies. Um, Normal is on the left and osteoporosis is on the right. And you can just see that there's fewer trabeculae and spicules. Um, so there's less spongy bone. This results in bones being brittle and more easily fractured. And um, in some cases, you, you see sort of a collapse of the vertebrae and you get this rounded um, uh, upper back that you can see in the picture on the left. Now causes of osteoporosis um, vary, but the most common cause is uh, menopause in women. So women are at greater risk after menopause because their ovaries are no longer producing estrogen. They still have some estrogen production by the adrenal gland, um, as do men. And men typically produce enough adrenal estrogen and they make testosterone lifelong. Um, the testes function producing testosterone for the rest of their lives. And that is enough to maintain bone density. So if osteoporosis develops, um, there are treatments that they can use to inhibit osteoclasts. Because if you recall, bone remodeling is happening all the time. Osteoclasts are breaking down bone and osteoblasts are depositing bone. Um, so if you inhibit the osteoclast normal activity, then um, the osteoblast deposition will, will outproduce um, the resorption of the bone matrix. So there's um, bisphosphonates that can be used and then also estrogen can be replaced. But the best thing to do is um, prevent osteoporosis and you can do that with weight bearing exercise and making sure you get enough dietary calcium and vitamin D. What weight bearing uh, on the bones does is it signals um, osteoblasts to deposit more matrix. So it's really important for women after menopause to maintain some physical weight bearing activity. Okay, now the other three disorders that I wanted to talk about um, are all inflammation of structures associated with the skeletal system. So arthritis, bursitis, tendonitis, that, that suffix itis means inflammation of. They differ in cause, but also in location. So we're going to focus first on the anatomy. Um, what you're seeing here is a picture of um, a joint. Just a second here. A picture of a joint. So we've got a, a bone here and a bone here. Now there's one structure called a ligament that keeps the bones together. Okay, and that isn't going to be part of our disorder here that we talk about today. In addition, between the two um, bones is a membrane called the synovial membrane that covers the ends of the, the bones and forms a cavity or a ca it's a capsule. So we call this a synovial membrane and the space where the blue is between the bones is called a synovial cavity. This is where arthritis takes place. 
this synovial cavity becomes inflamed. And we'll talk about what inflammation really is, but I'm sure you're familiar with swelling and pain, at least. Now, in addition to um, those, are, yeah, the arthritis structure being the synovial capsule, we have other structures associated with um, a joint, and that would be muscles that are attached. So here's a belly, a muscle belly. Here's one up here. And um, the outside of the muscle is covered in a connective tissue. And when the muscle tissue ends, the connective tissues merge together and form this fibrous cord-like structure that adheres the muscle to a bone. So these are called tendons. Now with overuse of the muscle, the tendon can also become inflamed or the tendon can rub up against bone and become irritated and so inflammation will take place. So that's for tendonitis. Okay. Now there's also often protective structures um, between a tendon and a bone, maybe between two bones and maybe even between the skin and bone so that any moving part doesn't scrape against bone. These protective structures are called bursa. And so here's a, a bursa. And in bursitis, that's what becomes inflamed, is the bursa. So let's next talk about inflammation, then we'll go over each of those individually. So there's four cardinal signs of inflammation. Redness, that's because uh, blood flow to a region increases. Heat, again, that's due to an increase in blood flow. Swelling, also due to an increase in blood flow, but in addition, um, the capillaries become permeable and many cells and extra fluid uh, escapes the blood and goes to the site that's irritated. And then finally is pain. Now accompanying the increased blood flow um, to an injured area or irritated area um, is increased immune cell activity, white blood cells. So white blood cells will phagocytize, uh, meaning eat up any debris that, you know, any um, pieces that have broken off or anything like that. And they might even start phagocytizing normal tissue. So you might get deterioration of structures due to white blood cells becoming overactive. But in other regions, like in bone, sometimes the white blood cells trigger the osteoblast to start making more bone, basically to repair what was eaten away. So the immune system becomes overactive and you get some deterioration followed by a repair process. But long-term inflammatory processes can cause permanent damage, either loss of tissue or just loss of function. And we'll look at some of those examples. <clears throat> so let's talk about the common causes of these three inflammatory processes. Um, arthritis has four different causes which I want to go over individually. The one that you're probably the most familiar with maybe is the typical wear and tear. It's the most common um, type of arthritis. Again remember that's where the two bones meet at the synovial uh, joint in the synovial cavity. Bursitis tends to happen when friction has occurred. That could be from overuse or it could be an impact trauma. Tendonitis has the same causes just in a different place. Sometimes infection, rarely though. So for arthritis, how do you treat it? It depends on what the cause was. So we'll talk about that individually. But for bursitis and tendonitis, as long as you don't have to do any kind of surgical repair of a tendon, 
like a tendon hasn't snapped. It's just, it's just inflamed, but still intact. You would do exactly the same treatments for both of these. Rest the injured area, provide ice, and use anti-inflammatory meds. Now, I, I have heard of a case where an individual had bursitis uh, in the knee, and one orthopedic surgeon recommended removing that bursa. Um, I thought that was a little ridiculous, so I said, Dad, don't do it. Anyway, um, and of course the swelling went down eventually. But I, I, I'm sure there's instances where you have to actually remove an inflamed bursa. So here are some pictures of um, bursitis. And I've also got a picture of a, of a joint over here. So let's look at the top picture first. So we have the scapula and the head of the humerus at the glenoid fossa. And there's various ligaments that keep, um, I guess, that keep the whole joint integrated and connected. So here's a ligament connecting bone to bone, okay? Two pieces of the clavicle. And then there's a lot of muscles at this um, joint. And here's one muscle coming over and attaching on the humerus right here. So this is a tendon. And if it becomes inflamed, it does enlarge. And that could press on other structures. For example, the bursa that's right above it has become swollen as well, because, most likely because it's getting pressed up against this bone, part of the acromion process of the scapula. Incidentally, this is also a tendon, but it's not inflamed. Okay, so that's just a kind of a joint structure to give you an idea of where a bursa might be located. Um, down here, we have one bursa near our olecranon process, and it's been sw it's swollen here. And we have several bursa around our kneecap. I don't know which one this one is. It's probably the prepatellar. But anyway, there's bursitis in that knee as well. So usually you just rest ice. Okay, now we'll talk about arthritis. It's a little bit more complicated. There's four different types of arthritis based on the cause. As I mentioned, the most common is the wear and tear type, which technically is called osteoarthritis. And there is a genetic component, it tends to run in families, um, but it can also just be age. Then there's rheumatoid arthritis, which is an autoimmune disorder. So your immune system begins attacking a joint. Then there's gout, which is actually a metabolic disorder. And there's a metabolic compound that deposits in joints, making them stiff. And then the fourth type is Lyme disease. That's actually a bacterial infection. So you can see that these causes are quite varied. And therefore, you're going to want many different treatments, right? And there may be different things happening inside the joint as well. In all cases, though, you get inflammation. So here's the most common type, right? So osteoarthritis, um, due to age, it can be due to impact injuries and overuse. There is a definitely probably a genetic component related to one of the collagens. There's many different types of collagen. And what usually happens first is that just due to wear and tear, Articular cartilage that's at the end of two bones, where they meet, degenerates, mainly from impact. Could, again, be due to genetics. It's not very good to begin with, right? So you get bone on bone, and you lose this nice um, hyaline cartilage that's smooth, so the two bones can glide across one another. Now you've got bone on bone. That could re result in the erosion of some bone and activate inflammatory cells. And inflammatory cells are in the blood. 
So they arrive, and of course, again, there will be some um, white blood cells that will chew up debris, and there will be some um, cells that help trigger bone deposition. The problem with the bone deposition is that it's sporadic as far as where it occurs, and you get these bone spurs that cause pain. And it makes a noise usually when you move the joint to, it's called crepitation, crunching sounds. Lovely, huh? So here's a picture of osteoarthritis, normal versus arthritis anyway. So here's normal on the left. We've got nice joint space between the, um, the femur and the tibia. The meniscus is intact. That's um, a fibrocartilage cushion. We've got nice hyaline cartilage at the end of the femur for gliding. It's perfect, okay? Textbook. But look over here on the right. We have degradation of some of the cartilage. Okay, it's broken down. That's what that is. And um, we have less joint space between the bones. The meniscus is pretty much eroded. But notice that we have extra bone deposition as well. So these are the bone spurs, okay? And those bone spurs clearly limit the mobility at this joint, right? I think this is probably the body's attempt at repairing. You lose cartilage, so you build up bone. That seems to be the way it works. Okay, let's talk about the second type of arthritis, rheumatoid arthritis. In this case, uh, it's an autoimmune reaction. So uh, for some unknown reason, usually genetics, uh, the immune system is activated, which in turn activates inflammatory cells, white blood cells. And antibodies are made by a certain type of white blood cell. Uh, B lymphocyte, that they then attack the synovial membrane. Okay, so they kind of break it down. So th what will happen is in th these inflammatory cells, again, will degrade bone or articular cartilage because they are activated thinking that there's something foreign in there that they've got to chew up, and instead they degrade healthy tissue. And the body will, in response to having the antibodies attack the synovial membrane, the body will try to repair that, and the synovial membrane will get thicker and thicker, and more synovial fluid will um, be made. So now the joint is swollen. It's bigger. So swelling occurs. We get lots of heat because there's more blood, lots of pain. Okay, And then bone deposition occurs to correct for the degradation that happened, okay, so the breakdown of bone. In this case, in rheumatoid arthritis, sometimes there's so much bone deposition that um, the joint will become completely ossified and immobile. So you may have seen pictures like this or know of elderly people that have um, the inability to flex or extend certain knuckles, that could be due to rheumatoid arthritis. I'm not going to pretend that I know for sure that it's rheumatoid just because it's shaped this way. But this is an indication that ossification of a joint has taken place. Okay, And the picture on the right is to show you inflammatory processes. Um, so this is a blood vessel which supplies this joint space. And there are a lot of white blood cells in here. Okay, I'm circling them. The macrophage um, usually is what chews up, sorry, chews up um, normal tissue as well as in any invasive sort of bacteria or something. But they also release cytokines which are chemicals that signal the other white cells to become active. So for example, here is a B lymphocyte that releases um, 
antibodies that are going to attack the synovial membrane. And the antibodies really just tag the synovial membrane and then the macrophage comes along and, and chews up the synovial membrane. But um, it was just to show you the connection between the blood and the joint, really. You don't have to memorize the actions of any of those particular cells. Okay, the third type of um, arthritis is called gout. And this is the one that's a metabolic disorder. What happens is that there's an increased concentration of uric acid in the blood. Now we normally have uric acid in our blood. When we break down any cell, we're breaking down nucleic acids, or when we break down mRNA, for example, um, after it's been used, we don't need it, we break it down. Uric acid is a normal product and it floats to the bloodstream and floats is a little, it's transported to the bloodstream. And then the kidneys filter it out and put it in the urine. So it's excreted from the blood, from the body, out. But in gout, there's so much uric acid that the kidney can't get rid of it all. And so there's excess uric acid in the blood and it comes out of the blood and deposits as crystals in joints. And what's interesting is often the first joint that's influenced is the big toe right there, okay, between the metatarsal and the first phalanx, or I should say the proximal phalanx. It happens to be the first as well. So because uric acid or crystals are being deposited here, that's something foreign that triggers the inflammatory process. And so all these cells come to this location, white blood cells, and they start trying to chew up the crystals, but they also destroy good stuff like the synovial membrane, the articular cartilage. And then bone deposition is trying to fix everything. So you get ossification or um, fusion of that joint, and it, it doesn't seem to be reversible. Uh, it tends to happen more in males than females, and it tends to run in families. So they looked for a genetic component, and they did find some genes that are involved in the transport of uric acid or urate into the urine. Okay, and there's a lot of transporters that I, are located here that are involved with that process. And um, if they don't, if they're not made correctly, these transporters due to the gene being mutated, then the uric acid will stay in the blood. Please don't memorize all that. It's not required. Okay, uh, Lyme disease is the last type of arthritis. Okay, it is actually a bacterial infection it does get into the blood. So the name of the bacteria is Borrelia burgdorferi. And vertebrates are reservoir hosts of this bacteria. And ticks tend to transmit it from one host to another. So the ticks acquire the bacteria when they bite and suck on the blood of a vertebrate that's already infected. With sucking up the blood, the bacteria gets into the tick and then the tick goes away and carries the bacteria to its second victim, which becomes the second host for the bacteria. Because when the ticks bite again, they can transmit the bacteria to the second host. Commonly, the first vertebrate that's infected is a mouse, a squirrel, or a deer. And the second vertebrate host is a human. At least that's what we see. And we can be tested for the presence of Lyme disease if our joints start getting achy and whatnot. They test by looking to see if your immune system has reacted to the presence of this bacteria. When your immune system reacts, it makes antibodies that are very specific against or for and will bind to this bacteria. 
So they're looking for those specific antibodies. If they see them, they see antibodies, then they'll treat with an antibiotic. And I think doxycycline is the most common. So the symptoms of Lyme disease that um, physicians usually will ask you about if you go in suspecting you have Lyme disease is first they want to know, they want to see where the bite was. They want to know where the tick bit you. So they're looking for this bullseye rash. So you usually get this ring, but the bite happened very centrally right here. The problem is that most of the time that's gone <laughs> or it's in a location you never saw. By the time you get to the doctor, it's either gone or, or, or you know, it was on your back and you couldn't see it. So um, that's a problem, but you will see an inflammatory reaction or feel it. You can get chills, fever, headache, muscle pain, kind of like the flu and itching and joint inflammation and a stiff neck. So it doesn't hurt to be tested for Lyme disease. Okay, that is the end of our skeletal system unit. Thank you very much.